uh, yeah, Arvind, so let's get started with uh, today's session. I mean, uh, the last session, the, it was a wonderful recap of the basic biological theory behind apoptosis and, um, you know, the kinds of, a bit of history also put into as to what were you thinking when you were trying to study these systems from a theoretical viewpoint. Um, from here, let's move on. Let's move on to the basics of, uh, you know, the apoptosis process itself, the domains and the proteins involved. Um, but before we get into all that, I just want to make a comment that, you know, in my, uh, my long interactions with you, one of the biggest eye openers, uh, besides the first day when we met, when you were talking about AFSR and uh, its relationship to other ATPases that are involved in apoptosis. And I must admit at that time, I didn't understand it fully, but I think the biggest uh, transition in my own thinking about apoptosis and um, the domains and proteins involved in it came in that 1999 paper. Um, I think it was published in TIBS and it had a wonderful cover um, titled The Domains of Death. And uh, you know, for me, it was a big eye opener because that was perhaps with very limited data. I mean, we did not have too many genomes then, but uh, you were able to show that in fact, many of these domains have their origins in prokaryotes. I mean, uh, it seems like a very easy thing to say today, but I think you can give us a better perspective of what it actually meant to do such an analysis uh, when with very limited data and actually come up with conclusions that form the basis for further analysis in the future. Yeah. So. One of the things which happened in the 90s, maybe starting uh, at the beginning of the 90s, but it caught steam around 96, 97, which was when I started laying the groundwork for what got eventually published in that uh, Tibbs paper. Uh, a good part of the work for that was done, I think, by 97. And uh, we had a lot of difficulty publishing that paper as uh, one could imagine uh, in these hotly uh, in these hot fields so to say which are uh, heavily contested uh, by parties with uh, comparable interests uh, especially the wet labs which wanted to characterize these proteins and why that was the case was because of a growing understanding that uh, apoptosis was very widespread at least in metazoa. Uh, there was some excellent work using genetics in uh, Cenorhabditis elegans, the nematode, uh, which uncovered some of the first uh, genes which regulated this process of apoptosis. And uh, those included SET3, which uh, had a peptidase domain, which later came to be known as the caspase peptidase domain. And then there was set four, uh, which was to be later the protein in which the APATPS domain was defined. And then we had set nine, which was uh, BCL2, the BCL2 homolog from CL GANS. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the CLGANS work sort of tied in very well with work going on in vertebrates, especially vertebrate immunity, where it became apparent that similar factors were involved, one of which was uh, BCL2, which came out as the homologue of uh, SED9. And a range of caspases were also uncovered in the work on vertebrates, uh, peptidases related to set three, which eventually led to them being defined as the caspase peptidase. So what this suggested was that there was a common mechanism for apoptosis, which was conserved in vert uh, between vertebrates and nematodes. So it went back fairly deep, perhaps to the base of the animals itself. We didn't have the basal lineages of animals like sponges and uh, nidarians at that point, but uh, still it was fairly deep uh, in the animal tree where you could trace back uh, 
at least two key, three key players. Uh, this ATPS domain, which was found uh, shared by uh, set four and vertebrate homologues, which were called APF1. And uh, this peptidase domain, the caspase peptidase domain shared between set three and a slew of caspases, uh, which were uncovered in uh, vertebrates. And this peculiar membrane protein, which seemed to associate with the mitochondrial membrane called SED9, uh, whose homolog was BCL2. So there was a certain canvas uh, which was being populated by a relatively sparse painting, but uh, still a discernible set of figures which were shared uh, across uh, divergent metazoids. So that was sort of the stage when uh, I entered the, the molecular realm to test out some of the ideas which we had, uh, which we discussed the last time uh, relating to uh, these systems which might uh, be deleterious to a cell, but still be selected if they have a balancer and if the deleterious activity resulting in the death of a cell could uh, uh, somehow confer fitness through uh, the principle of inclusive fitness because of kin uh, being advantaged by the self-sacrifice uh, of a cell. So what became clear was that uh, this caspase peptidase domain could potentially play the role of uh, such a molecule which could have this kind of deleterious effect by cleaving key molecules uh, within the cell and resulting in the death of the cell. So it was one of the first effectors uh, wherein there was biochemical clarity in terms of how it might act. Uh, what also became clear was that the caspases were probably acting through a proteolytic cascade where there were multiple steps of proteolysis with one caspase cleaving another. And this again had certain parallels in developmental biology. The Drosophila uh, genetics had uncovered uh, a whole series of peptidolytic events uh, through peptidases which are not related to caspases, those were serine peptidases, caspases were thiol peptidases, uh, but there was a parallel set of events in uh, Drosophila, which uh, determined dorsoventral polarity in the very early stages of embryogenesis. So you had a series of these serine peptidases, which uh, cleaved each other in, or cleaved the successive member of the cascade and activated a developmental pathway. So here you had a parallel wherein the caspases activated a program for death. Uh, but what was sort of disappointing for me, but uh, perhaps I should have known better and only much later I realized what it all meant was to see that there was no real parallel to bacterial systems which were emerging at that time, which could be compared to the phenomenon of uh, programmed cell death. As we spoke of the last time, there were already the RM systems which had been known for decades by them. And there was nothing really at that point, uh, it was to change in the future, but at that point, the RM systems looked nothing like uh, these caspase uh, act activated uh, systems which uh, triggered death. Now, uh, there was one parallel, however, to the toxin antitoxin systems. And that was seen in this BCL2 family. So there were members of the BCL2 family which could be termed pro-apototic or they furthered cell death. They were uh, causes of cell death. Whereas there were parologous members which were anti-apototic. So they acted in the reverse manner by preventing cell death. And this distinction was uh, very clearly emerging, especially in vertebrates where we had multiple paralogs uh, of the BCL2 family. So 
I could see the analogy to the bacterial uh, toxin antitoxin systems, uh, wherein one member, the toxin, is pro death, mm -hmm. and the antitoxin is uh, preventing that death. And moreover, at that point, it became clear that phenomena like uh, addiction of plasmids could be mediated by these toxin antitoxin systems. So the antitoxin tended to be labile. And um, uh, if it got degraded, for some reason, the toxin would act because that tended to be more stable than the labile antitoxin. So if a cell which had a plasmid with a TA system on it, and uh, it lost the plasmid, then the labile antitoxin would be lost, would degrade soon. And the persistent, the most stable toxin would still remain as a protein and it would kill cells uh, which have lost the plasmid, thereby enforcing a certain addiction for uh, the plasmid. So I could imagine that there was some parallel uh, between this and the emergence of BCL2 based systems where the, there was an addiction caused by the presence of pro and apotot, uh, pro and anti apoptotic systems which eventually got fixed due to some advantage uh, they were conferring perhaps through the kin selection uh, mechanism, which we spoke of earlier. Uh, but uh, they didn't look like any known TA systems I had uh, studied at that point. And the 90s were still very early days uh, in our understanding of those systems. And likewise, the caspases didn't uh, seem to have any uh, parallels in RM systems or anything like that. One important development which happened was a set of non-catalytic domains. So it was clear that the peptidase domain of the caspase was not the only thing that the protein contained. For example, caspase 8 uh, from vertebrates, it had a duplicated domain which was N-terminal to that caspase domain. And set three also had some domain which was upstream of that, uh, upstream of the caspase domain to its end terminus. And these uh, duplicated domains in say caspase eight, you could find them elsewhere in other proteins which are emerging in the vertebrate immune system uh, as mediators of cell depth and, and related inflammation uh, signaling processes. So one such protein was FAD which had a region uh, homologous to that uh, found upstream of caspase 8. And uh, similarly, that region upstream of the caspase in set 3 could now be found uh, upstream of the ATPS domain in uh, something like uh, set 4 or APF1. So what to start us uh, was that there may be some other domains. And the first few of these domains to be defined uh, based on these fusions to the catalytic domains where a triad termed as depth, dead, and card. And uh, the structure predictions and eventually structure solutions suggested that they were all alpha helical. At the point I started looking at them, uh, they were seen as a, a clear common denominator in the mediation of depth across uh, a variety of system, animal systems. Um, but the relationship between them was not clear. So one of the first things I embarked on was to try to understand each of these domains. The, at that point, there was this whole literature uh, based on bad sequence analysis where people used to find uh, BCL2-like or death-like domains in all kinds of proteins, uh, which turned out to be uh, false hits. So uh, I did spend some time sort of entertaining myself, uh, showing the falsity of uh, several of these relationships. Um, but in the process, I also gained something positive in realizing uh, that ultimately these were related. And I should mention at this point that there were some major methodological advances also taking place in the realm of sequence analysis, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you're uh, very well familiar with because 
perhaps that was the time when you start, also started getting interested in this issue of discovery through sequence analysis. That's right, that's right. So prior to that, uh, most of the methods involved transitive searching uh, with uh, pairwise search methods like FASTA and BLAST. And there were some primitive uh, methods for profile-based searches, less uh, advanced. And at that point, uh, two methods came which improved this profile-based searching. One was at NCBI, which was uh, uh, Cyblast. And it was shortly after Cyblast was published that I moved to NCBI. Uh, so I was sort of caught up uh, in the early days of the development of Cyblast. And parallelly, there were, there were uh, hidden Marco model-based methods uh, like uh, Hammer. Uh, those were inferior, at least in my hands, to start with, and they caught up only later. Uh, Cyblast, uh, for an experienced uh, sequence analyst, uh, Cyblast clearly provided the advantage of speed, and you could run uh, literally uh, hundreds of those searches and extend your reign uh, or your uh, range of detection, uh, wherein you could find more distant uh, relationships and assess their uh, uh, statistical significance. And uh, one of the things I was involved in at NCBI was developing the reverse process, which initially was uh, embodied in the program Impala, and it subsequently gave birth to reverse Cyblast, which we use these days. So that uh, allowed these profiles to be used as a mechanism of detecting versions in uh, target proteins once you had built a good profile. So the experiments with these early uh, profile-based uh, searches was very critical in unifying and presenting evidence that these three domains, uh, alpha helical domains, which had emerged uh, as a common denominator across uh, several uh, proteins implicated in apoptosis and metazoans, DEAD, DEPTH, and CARD uh, had a common origin and they had probably diverged because of a very specific reason, that is homotypic interaction. So one thing which we were to understand much more clearly later uh, which struck me was, why do you have a common denominator for a process like apoptosis at all, especially when it is being fused to so many different domains, often enzymatic domains, like depth, dead, and CARD, they were fused to caspases, kinases, ATPases, uh, a GTPase-like domain. Um, so what did all this mean? So one very simple way of interpreting it was that these were mediating homotypic interactions. That is, a dead domain interacted with another dead domain. And thus, it helped to bring together different kinds of effector activities, uh, which could then catalyze various aspects of uh, apoptosis-related signaling. And a corollary to this was that if you have homotypic interaction and you undergo a divergence which locks you in a slightly different uh, part of the sequence space, then uh, the simplest way in which you can maintain the divergent version is if it undergoes a duplication and a second copy of that emerges. And that's what probably catalyzed or cat catalyzed in a very uh, general sense. That's what selected for the emergence of these uh, distinct uh, versions of the death-like uh, domain, death, dead, and card. So uh, that was an important evolutionary understanding, uh, which uh, was to play a role in our future studies in this direction, uh, down to what we did in the past uh, four years. Now, one other thing which came up was that these dead domains, if they are not fused to these 
catalytic domains, they tended to be fused to cell surface receptors. And the most famous of these were members of the TNF like ligand receptor family, which included TNF receptor itself, uh, the FAS receptor, which binds to FAS ligand, which is related to the TNF, and uh, a set of related uh, receptors like that. Then the, one of the nerve growth factor receptors, which binds a completely different kind of ligand, uh, which is a cysteine knot, the nerve growth factor, that also had a dead domain. So the finding that different receptors have the dead domain uh, also played well with this I developing idea that homotypic interaction was a big driver in the evolution of these death-like domains. Because this way, extracellular signals, which were becoming increasingly important as uh, purveyors of apoptosis, could be linked to the intracellular events which uh, result in the death of the cell. So uh, one thing in uh, vertebrate immune systems, in jawed vertebrate immune systems in particular, is uh, the use of adaptive immunity. So you don't want autoimmunity. So a, an immunocyte like a T cell or a B cell, which might recognize an autoantigen needs to be killed. And that killing happens through uh, uh, receptor mediated uh, killing of self recognition. So uh, that made sense of linking an internal process of apoptosis to the sensing of an external signal. And this signal could be uh, delivered in the form of a soluble ligand like uh, the tumor necrosis factor or uh, the FAS ligand. So this first phase of understanding, I think the biggest lesson, which uh, at least I got out of it, was uh, the unification of these death-like domains, which were known to date at that point uh, by, by 1997 or so. And uh, the fact that homotypic interactions bringing together a diverse range of catalytic activities might be one of the factors which uh, was driving uh, the proliferation of this uh, family of death-like domains in metazoan apoptosis systems. So the next thing which sort of came to light uh, was the pursuit for bacterial homologs. So as I told you in the, in the beginning, I was a bit disappointed that there, there seemed to be no connection between these systems and what we knew in bacteria. So I decided to go the other way. And since I had this hint that uh, there was a relationship between uh, these plant resistance genes and AFSR, whether there could be some other such re relationship, broader set of relationships. And given the database at that time, the non-redundant database, it was much smaller than what we have today. We didn't have uh, any major complete eukaryotic genomes other than yeast. Uh, even C. elegans had not yet been uh, completed. And the human genome was still several years into the future. Uh, we had some limitations in terms of what we could detect, but enzymatic domains uh, were definitely much more easier to pursue than uh, what we could do with, say, the depth and the card domains. So I did do that, and what became clear, well, the most remarkable findings was that many of these key effectors had uh, a bacterial root. And that was one of the big findings presented in the Tibbs paper, right. uh, which you mentioned. So uh, three domains could be traced back to uh, clearly to bacteria. And two of them we knew at that point were definitely enzymatic. So one of these were 
uh, one of this was the ATPS domain, which could be found in uh, the plant resistance proteins like N from tobacco and its homologs from Arabidopsis, of which we were seeing very many at that point. And they could be unified with APAF1 and SET4, uh, the apoptotic ATPS regulators from metazoans, and with the prokaryotic uh, versions like AFSR from uh, Streptomyces, by then several additional actinomycete proteins from Mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, and uh, also certain um, uh, firmicutes like GUT R from Bacillus. Mm -hmm. uh, they could all be brought under this umbrella of a common uh, NTPAs domain. And that uh, domain was named the APATPS domain. That's what we called it for the first time in that uh, TIBS paper, because uh, it unified a variety of proteins involved in apoptosis. And for the first time, we could bring together some related phenomena in plants uh, and animals, since the, as we discussed the last time, the plant uh, hypersensitivity reaction is, uh, very comparable to uh, apoptosis and metazoans. And here we had a common uh, player in those, and they could all be traced back to this bacterial group. The second uh, such thing which became uh, apparent was the caspase domain. So the caspase story was a little more uh, interesting in that uh, it was not that easy. It was way more difficult than uh, the unification was way more difficult. And it was one of the best pieces of sequence analysis I had done uh, till that point in time. So uh, those, the, the, it involved a successive expansion of the caspase clade. So the, for the first time, I found that there were caspase-like peptidases which were a sister group to all metazoan caspases. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of these was found in some other metazoa, and it was also found in, uh, in dictyostelium at that point. And I termed that the paracaspase. So it was sort of inspired by this uh, notation which we use in chemistry for the uh, side groups in aromatic uh, compounds. Ortho uh, <laughs> yeah, the, so if the caspases were the ortho, mm -hmm. then you had a para group to them, which uh, were the para caspases. So these para caspases were there in both uh, humans and C. elegans at that point. And very interestingly, instead of a death domain, they had uh, immunoglobulin domains at their end terminus. And then, uh, remarkably, uh, a second set of these emerged in the searches, which were found in plants and fungi. And I termed those the metacaspases. Mm -hmm. So it showed that even in the eukaryotes, you had a broader range of caspase-like thiol peptidases. It was, till that point, there were no close relatives of caspases which were known, or there were no relatives outside the caspase clade which were known. But here I had managed to put in two more uh, groups, two more clades, which were successive sister groups to the caspases, the paracaspases and the metacaspases. And the discovery of these two allowed us to finally extend the range of caspases into uh, the bacterial world. And a whole range of bacterial caspases eventually came up. But uh, to start with, I detected only two. One was uh, in uh, rhizobium, the nit nitrogen-fixing uh, bacterium. And the other was in actinomycete. Now, that uh, was actually added in the proof. It was a note added in the proof uh, of uh, that TIBS paper, which you mentioned. Oh, oh. Because you so, can't actually find these uh, meta and paracaspases. <laughs> I mean, and well, the, the paracaspases were very explicitly described in that paper. Mm 
Okay. But these bacterial ones oh, right, right. Uh, from actinomyces and uh, rhizobium, right, right. the rhizobium meliloti protein, for example, it's uh, explicitly mentioned in that note added right. in proof right, right, right. Uh, in that paper. So it, it was uh, sort of towards the end of that uh, project. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it, there's a bit of a backstory there. That paper, as I said, went through many. Uh, journals and many rounds and uh, we were sort of quite tired and didn't want to uh, add anything to the text because there were strict size limits and uh, it looked as though we would win the battle in tips even though it was keenly contested uh, right. as you know referees can be idiots uh, <laughs> <laughs> so i think that needs to be stated clearly <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, this was also a time when, you know, I mean, this was even slightly before my times, but there will always be that disbelief right, uh, that right. such a thing is even, that such relationships are possible or such, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, that they are even mm -hmm. bacteria. And many people would actually mm -hmm. say, I remember mm -hmm. uh, something like, uh, you know, I can show that BSA is re related to anything. Bovine serum albumin is related to anything with these sequences. So, there was a kind of disbelief that was uh, very prevalent, especially amongst uh, experimentalists. And there were not many people in the sequence analysis field then yet. So uh, That's uh, right. Uh, that's right. And uh, indeed, there was a whole culture of aligning uh, bovine serum albumin with other proteins. That kind of culture existed even in the apoptosis field. As I told you, there was a whole slew of reports of discovering dead, dead domains. Right. And uh, yeah, that story was to repeat itself uh, with uh, relatives of this APA TPS domain, which uh, I'll come to, right. uh, where people would find all kinds of relationships through uh, pseudo sequence analysis. That if they got a, a hunch that two things should be related, they would just align it. And uh, you would very well remember the paper which we wrote with many other sequence analysts right. uh, on uh, the, the which was titled QED, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which <laughs> uh, in a very uh, uh, geometric of as though proving some geometric theorem, they would just establish uh, the relation. They would say these two things are related with no uh, objective measure of that. Right. Uh, so anyhow. Uh, so it was tough to publish this. Obviously. This paper was remarkably tough to publish. And uh, so that caspase, the extension of the caspases to the bacteria, we didn't have space and we didn't want to put it less that re referee. Now, uh, go back. We had brought it almost to the point of acceptance. And now if we put this new thing. <laughs> right. So yeah, it's just there in the note uh, added in the proofs. Mm -hmm. and that point was further elaborated once we had many more uh, eukary or few more eukaryotic genomes many would be a stretch because uh, by that point we had c elegans drosophila and at the time uh, to mark the publication of the human genome um, we were invited to by the science magazine to present a, uh, the history of apo the apototic systems right. and uh, that we got to tell the story a little more clearly we had more genomes and this connection or uh, this discovery of caspases in bacteria could be uh, extended a little more the very key point which we made in that paper and which became uh, amply apparent since then was there had to be some kind of functional link even in bacteria between these APA TPases, this family which unified things like APAF1, SED4, said, uh, said sorry, uh, the plant uh, resistance genes, and the bacterial ones uh, like AFSR, when the cyanobacterial genomes started coming in, like anabena. So there, we saw for the first time a fusion between the bacterial caspase homologs and the APA TPSs, and that's uh, shown in that uh, science paper. The true history of that, and or the true understanding of what that meant, uh, was something which lay in the future. 
uh, which will sort of be the culmination of this uh, series. So anyhow, to uh, keep it short, uh, apart from the cast space, there was a third domain, which was uh, even less understood, but gathering some degree of steam at that point. And that was the TIR domain, which is for toll interleukin receptor domain. So the very first time it was observed was as a common domain shared by these toll receptors, uh, whose role in immunity uh, was not initially understood. Toll has been exapted, to use a word of uh, Gould, for a developmental role uh, in the same dorsoventral developmental uh, role or in drosophila of dorsoventral polarity. So that's where this receptor toll was first detected through uh, a genetics, through the classic genetic screens uh, studying drosophila development. Subsequently, it became clear that uh, this toll of drosophila did have a role in immunity in drosophila. And uh, what happened on the vertebrate side of the story or the gnathostome side of the story was the discovery of several homologs of the drosophila toll. And these became known as the toll-like receptors, the now famous TLRs. But uh, those were very early days when uh, not much was known of what the TLRs were doing. And uh, they, uh, one thing which was understood was that the intracellular part, so they had extracellular leucine rich repeats, um, which was a very characteristic feature of these toll like receptors. But they also had a very distinct globular intracellular domain. And that intracellular domain was homologous to the intracellular domain of the interleukin 1 receptor. So the interleukin 1 receptor has three immunoglobulin domains uh, in the extracellular part. And intracellularly, it has uh, this domain which it shares with the toll receptor. So that's why TIR, the toll interleukin 1 receptor domain. And uh, there was one other protein which uh, whose role in apoptosis and immunity was sort of just becoming clear. We were just beginning to understand it, which was mid-88. And that interestingly combined a death domain with this uh, TIR domain. So uh, we had multiple examples of this TIR domain. And the next place it showed up was in these plant APATPases. And interestingly, the plant APATPases have a long run of LRRs, but these are intracellular LRRs, unlike uh, the extracellular LRRs, which you were to study quite a bit in right. <laughs> the years which yeah. came by. And, and, the yeah, and the very interesting lamprey immunity story. But uh, these are LRRs, but distinct, the, the intracellular ones are distinguished from most extracellular ones in not having those two uh, things, LRR NT and LRR CT, two specialized uh, versions of the LRR, which are present, which sort of tie the knot at the N and the C terminus of these LRRs. So these LRRs, uh, just to give a brief uh, account, form a toroidal structure. Usually it's not a complete torus, so it's like a horseshoe. And that can serve as a good interface to bind uh, molecules uh, on the extracellular surface or on the other side of the membrane. And thus they play a role parallel to the immunoglobulin uh, domains, which are masters of recognizing um, other molecules, uh, both through their beta sheet as well as the loops uh, between the strands. So uh, these plant proteins, they had an APATPS domain and a run of LRRs at their C terminus. And at the end terminus, they had the same TIR domain. So one thing which caught my attention was that in mid-88, this TIR domain came C terminal to a death domain. And this architecture was very similar to what we observed for uh, some catalytic domains. Uh, like, say, 
the card domain and the cas space uh, or the dead domains and the cas space and the death domain and se several kinases like iraq and uh, rip one where it's in the other configuration the death is at the c so right then it struck me that this uh, toll uh, this toll interleukin one receptor domain tir might be enzymatic and uh, looking more closely at its structure, it was very obvious that it was going to adopt a Rosmanoid fold because it had a regular run of uh, al of uh, strands and alpha helices. So it was a beta alpha, uh, beta alpha set of units. And this was something which we finally uh, deciphered uh, many years later. Yeah. And uh, we can talk about that down the line, but at that point, all I could say was that it was likely to be enzymatic. Yeah, yeah, uh, I remember but, this right from the first time uh, I came to the NPBI that you said this this has got to be enzymatic, but we still don't have a clear picture of what it's doing. Right, but its activity was very hard to game. Understanding its activity took us a lot more effort, and many more years had to pass by till we cracked the secret of its activity. Uh, but right then, it was uh, these architectural uh, features suggested that it was an enzymatic domain. But the dominant view at that point was that it was some kind of an adapter, similar to the death and death-like domains. So in that first uh, work in the Tibbs paper, it is put in that adapter category. Uh, even though I knew that that was not a very comfortable fit for it. And it was shown similarly in the science uh, paper, which was a follow up on that. Right. So uh, that was one thing where you know something, but you're unable to state it very clearly because if you say well, it's an enzyme, then uh, you have to say at least something about its activity. And that was, uh, I didn't have a clue at that point what its activity might be. Uh, so uh, given uh, that it looked enzymatic, it did have promise in terms of uh, being a better search prospect in sequence profile searches to find its homologs. And what happened was that in that uh, PIBS paper itself, I found the first prokaryotic uh, versions of it, mm -hmm. uh, which interestingly were fused to APATPases in prokaryotes, just as they are fused to APATPases in plants. And uh, that was a very important clue, which suggested that you had some kind of a functional complex, uh, even in prokaryotes, of uh, the APATPase, the caspase, and the TIR domain. So at least these catalytic domains, uh, they seem to come in the same polypeptide in prokaryotes. And uh, the eukaryotic versions seem to be uh, derivations from something which had already shown quite an evolutionary history in prokaryotes. In fact, we had some interesting combinations uh, which were unique to prokaryotes, which you could not find uh, elsewhere. Uh, for example, that in the science paper that anabina caspase APATPS fusion uh, right. and the earlier TIR uh, APATPS fusion. Of that, the TIR APATPS fusion you see in eukaryotes, so the caspase APATPS fusion does not did not exist at that point in any eukaryote. Uh, and what it suggested was that uh, the caspase functioned with the APATPase, which it does in eukaryotes too, uh, recruited by a card, uh, card uh, interaction. So uh, you had a prokaryotic diversification, which spawned these versions in uh, eukaryotes. So that was uh, the, the beginning of a long story, which I must confess we didn't fully understand at that point. 
to summarize it, what we did understand was that these domains were likely functioning together in prokaryotes. Uh, they tended to be present in prokaryotes, which had some kind of uh, development or multicellular or more pronounced multicellularity. What I mean by that is that they have a sustained period of differentiated uh, cells uh, in course of their life cycle which you see both in the case of cyanobacteria like anabina, which have uh, uh, these specialized cells like heterosis, which are a terminal uh, stage in their life. And uh, they produce these propagating uh, cells, which uh, can be used to found new filaments. And streptomyces are very well known to have that hyphal growth and bare spores in the sense there is a morphological parallel to the fungi and uh, umai seeds of uh, the eukaryotic side of the tree so there were uh, there were hints even then that uh, there seemed to be some link between these effectors and regulators of apoptosis in uh, the eukaryotic side of things with uh, those uh, found in prokaryotes and uh, that they correlated with multicellularity so i think th those were sort of the correct inferences which we made one other direction this work took was the discovery of new domains which might play some role uh, in the apototic process. And one of those was the pyrin domain, uh, which turned out to be the fourth member of that death-like superfamily. So we found that pyrin domain uh, sometime after the Tibbs paper was uh, published and it went into that uh, science paper. Right. And the discovery of the pyrin domain was accompanied by the discovery of yet another domain related to the APATPSs, the NACT ATPS domain. Right, right, right. So this story sort of went hand in hand with that bad sequence analysis, which I alluded to. Right. So uh, there were some proteins uh, in which false AP-like ATPS domains were reported. And they were found to be homo they were claimed to be homologous to some other proteins in which no real AP ATPS domains were known at that point. And trying to sort all those out made it clear that one subset of them were false, and another subset of them defined a new ATPS domain. New in the sense it could very clearly be distinguished based on a set of motifs from the AP ATPSs. But uh, it showed very parallel architectures in that uh, it had N-terminal domains, which may be like of the death-like superfamily. So one of them had a card domain, very parallel to uh, APAF1. And then uh, there was a C-terminal region, which tended to con contain these super secondary structure forming repeats. Uh, so those were things like, uh, say, LRRs or uh, WD-40 repeats that which form uh, beta propellers. So uh, there seemed to be a architectural uh, language which was common to both of these. The presence of an N-terminal uh, adapter of the death-like superfamily and C-terminal. Uh, super secondary structure uh, forming repeats. And uh, one of the things which also emerged from this work was that they had a bacterial equivalent. So actinomycetes also had this knocked uh, type of APATPS. So it was the split between APATPSs and the knocked had happened in the bacteria. And uh, they were separately inherited through some lateral transfer event, two distinct lateral transfer events in the least by uh, eukaryotes. 
in the in the case of Knox, uh, they were found in uh, metazoans, and we also found them in fungi. And <clears throat> these fungal versions were interesting because there were these HET E1 proteins, which were just then emerging in fungi as mediators of this process of heteroincompatibility. Okay. So uh, the heteroincompatibility process, just to give a brief uh, background, is the when fungi have the same compatibility type and their hyphae meet each other, they can anastomose, that is, they join each other and form a syncytium. However, if they are not compatible, they don't join each other and there is a localized depth of the hyphae so that they don't merge into each other. So here you have a fungal self, non-self recognition process which involves cell death. And we could find a protein involved in that process which was related to, uh, which had this AP. Uh, this uh, knocked ATPS domain, which was related to ATPS domains found in uh, animal uh, proteins involved in uh, cell death. So uh, here it showed that there was probably a common denominator for cell death across eukaryotes with roots in prokaryotes. So even though they are very disparate phenomena, the face of it, like heteroincompatibility or uh, hypersensitivity in plants or various cell death events in animals, including those related to immunity and inflammation, uh, there were common players. And what this meant was that there was a, a certain spread of a set of proteins which could confer this capacity for apoptosis to emerge in an organism. So right then it suggested to me that maybe the spread of these kinds of molecules uh, through the tree of life, that is these proteins spreading through the tree of life, likely through lateral transfer, at least from bacteria to eukary different eukaryotic lineages in the first place. Uh, might have gone hand in hand with the emergence of multicellularity. And we had at least four candidates at this point, the TIR domain, the caspases, the broader group of caspase like peptidases, that is uh, the APATPases and the NACT ATPases. But what was not clear is what do they do in prokaryotes uh, in terms of the cell death-like functions? The reason that was not clear was because the bacterial homologs, which first came to our notice, like uh, GUT-R or AFSR or MALT, uh, which defines another related family of ATPases, they all turned out to be sensory proteins wherein those super secondary structure forming repeats, they serve as a sensory uh, module akin to what they do in the eukaryotic apoptosis system. But rather than activating a cell death program, they have N-terminal or in some cases C-terminal uh, helix turn helix domains, HTH domains, which are DNA binding domains. And these regulate uh, the genes other genes in the operon in which they are coded or the regulon which they control. And uh, that regulation is a transcriptional regulation in essence. It's not, uh, it's, it's a very intense kind of regulation in that you consume ATP in order to regulate transcription. But uh, other than that, it could be just seen as a one component transcription system <coughs> with a variant with a variation of an ATP consuming step. Uh, so uh, you, if you want to, to utilize a, a resource which is expensive to utilize, you probably want to control uh, that pathway of going into committing for the enzymes which may utilize, say, maltose. So you want to regulate it by setting a threshold 
And it became clear that these uh, NACT and APA TPS like domains in these transcription factor like pro or transcription factors of prokaryotes were helping set that threshold. Now, that threshold principle could be extended to the animal and plant systems because you don't want to kill your cell uh, at the drop of a hat, so to say. <coughs> you want to uh, pass a certain threshold of the signal which is driving apoptosis, a pro-apoptotic signal, which may come from a viral infection or the binding of a self-antigen in a vertebrate immunocyte or uh, an intrinsic process coming through uh, signaling via something like uh, uh, TNF binding its receptor uh, where that signal crosses a certain threshold. So that threshold, once it crosses the threshold, you commit to the pathway of cell death because you cannot come out of that. It, it's a, a terminal point. So that was the commonality which we could infer uh, between the prokaryotic transcriptional systems with APA TPases and the eukaryotic apoptosis systems. But it didn't look, uh, despite the fusions which we found, that we understood what was going on in these uh, prokaryotes? Was there a true apoptosis-like process which mirrored uh, what we saw in eukaryotes, especially in the context of immunity, which was common to both plants and animals? And that was something which lay way into the future and pertains to our more uh, recent work. But at least these ideas which were to uh, inspire our more recent work sort of took shape in these early studies. Right, and, and actually, I mean, this is just a un, sort of not really related to science comment, but the funny thing that I always uh, remark or feel is that the science paper was actually a very uh, thorough and deep analysis. And it has rarely been, that is many of these proteins in subsequent studies, those very same domains that you identify here, have, were not even known or identified. So people have not been reading this <laughs> science paper as much. And in fact, that one figure that you have in, in the science paper is actually a very informative figure that if perhaps if people had paid more attention could have uh, directed their studies even better. It's just my own feeling, you know, after all these years. Yeah, there were a lot of rediscoveries of the material uh, presented there. Uh, you know, there's a tendency for people to ignore works which are not presented in the magazine. But uh, here is an example of stuff which was presented there, uh, which actually got rediscovered. Yeah, lots of examples. <laughs> I, I don't think it's worth going into that right now, but... Um, right, yes. right. I don't, yeah. But uh, uh, since we talk of some domains there, we may touch upon a few things which we ourselves understood better. Right. Uh, we could take this in two directions, but I'll just, lie, I'll just point to one domain which is quite ignored from that paper. And that is uh, the ZooFi domain. Correct. So this ZooFi domain was first found in the Zona Pellucida protein, uh, which is uh, something in uh, which was first found in vertebrates in the vertebrate zona pellucida and unc5 which came up in uh, a genetic screen in c elegans uh, for neural uh, path finding the way the axons uh, find their path the group of proteins called the natrins interestingly the author of the natrins used a samskrita word Right, for the you eye. Get, yeah. No, no, it was not from Netra. Oh, I see. It is from Netra, that is leader. Oh, the leader, which, okay. Which in the nominative case, we would have correctly Neta. called Neta. But right. I guess these people simply wanted to use a Samskrita word and they used its base form, Netra. Right, right. So, yeah. so it is like the, it's like the leader, right. since it leads the path of the axon. Uh, towards its right uh, articulation or its uh, the right connection. 
And it was in, in the course of the study of these natrons that uh, Unk Phi came up. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what uh, we found was that this Unk Phi and uh, the Zona Pellucida proteins share this common domain, just uh, N terminal to the death domain, which is the Zu Phi domain. And uh, subsequently, we understood the Zu Phi is an autopeptidase domain. And subsequently, we found these in bacterial uh, toxins, cell surface toxins, which are related to the polymorphic toxins. Uh, and it became clear then that there, it functions as a peptidase, which is autoproteolytically cleaving off and releasing that toxin part uh, so that it can diffuse away or it can be taken up by the rival cell. And similarly, there are related proteins in bacteria with some other enzymes, which may process extracellular molecules like carbohydrates and lipids, uh, which have this autopeptidolytic zoo phi domain. And so that autopeptidase event is the one which releases those associated uh, enzymatic domains, which may then diffuse away to process things in the extracellular matrix of bacteria. So we eventually understood in course of that work uh, on the polymorphic toxins and related toxin systems that the Zufi domain was also a bacterial acquisition. Uh, although it came from a very different uh, functional context there, that it was in this extracellular system of processing proteins through autopeptidase activity. But uh, in the apoptotic systems, it was acquired as an intracellular domain, uh, evidently from some bacterial endosymbiont uh, of the eukaryotes. And there is one apoptotic protein called PIDD, PID, mm -hmm. uh, which has uh, a couple of these zoophy domains and it undergoes autopeptidase uh, activity, um, autopeptidolytic cleavage through this. Um, through these zoophy domains, releasing parts of it, uh, which can then transduce an apoptotic signal. So uh, that was one of those domains which got ignored and uh, there were some rediscoveries and publications of it. This is one of the downsides of publishing in the magazine. You cannot uh, do enough justice describing the domain, its active site and so on, which uh, we just didn't have the space for. But uh, eventually in that, uh, in the polymorphic toxin paper, we put all this together to show its uh, bacterial origins. And there are a group of seven TM receptors, um, G, G protein coupled receptors, GPCRs, which also undergo autopeptidolysis, which have acquired a zoophy domain. And the Zufi domain there has again come from these the same bacterial systems. And then there's a nuclear pore protein, which uh, undergoes an autopeptidolytic processing. And that has a Zufi domain too. So the Zufi domains from, this, from these bacterial cell surface processing um, systems, including toxins, have acquired a very rich life in very different eukaryotic contexts perhaps starting from the very event of eukaryogenesis where it became a nucleo, uh, nuclear membrane uh, component. So uh, that, that was one example of a, of a sort of an ignored domain. Hmm. So um, anyhow, that, that's one side of the story. One, kind of extension. The other thing which we understood much better after this work in two uh, con consecutive steps and what brought us closer to this link to the prokaryotic systems, which may function analogous to the eukaryotic systems in uh, cell death and uh, perhaps inclusive fitness. Uh, is the characterization of the stand clade of NTPases. Right, right. I, I mean, I just wish to comment, you know, before we get into that, is that right. this is one of the most, uh, even today, the P2 ATPases 
are never fully understood outside. Um, although there have been very, uh, there have been several studies, I think, which you started from very early on, uh, before even before the standard, the A plus, and there was something on GTPAs, as I recollect, and then the basic divisions of the ASCII and, uh, you know, uh, the other class of the KG, the KG. Kin kinases and GTP. Right, right. So, I mean, these were, it was also the period where a lot of these P loop. Uh, NTPSs were defined with very precise definitions that unfortunately have still not uh, transmitted normally. What one would think as one of the most uh, widely present domains in nature is still the most poorly understood or poorly even taught. You know, when you start off your career as a biologist, I would think that one should spend a whole semester on these <laughs> ATPSs and understanding their functions. Oh, I, I totally agree. I think there should be an ATPS course, which should be uh, made necessary, uh, or a it should be a mandatory course for uh, anyone doing biology at a molecular level, perhaps even if they are not doing it at a molecular level. Right. Uh, there, there is so much they can teach you. Uh, yeah, so there is a very general tendency to people understand the ABC transporters and related ABC ATPSs to a degree. The rest are just rolled into something called AA by many people without uh, seeing all the fine divisions. So uh, at, the, at that point, as you say, we had uh, worked on at least four major clades, the A ATPSs, the REC A, uh, F1, F0 ATPS clade, uh, the GTPases and the P loop kinases, mm -hmm. uh, which most of which, unlike these others, which hydrolyze NTP, the, the kinases catalyze phosphotransfer, phosphorylating substrates. Um, so we had at that point the AP ATPases and the NARPs, and there was a growing realization that they were related. And uh, I had found some earlier relationships to some things like multi. So it meant that this clade was a much larger clade. So I began a very concerted effort to characterize that clade in total and try to find all its uh, relationships and it, its true extent. And what came out of that work was that it had a certain crown or uh, a very clearly related uh, subclade within it, which included the NARC, the AP ATPases, and a few other clades like MALTI itself, which I mentioned earlier, and something called NA, something called SWACOS, which we defined uh, when we published that work. And these all fitted at the same general paradigm uh, in that they had a central. Uh, they tended to be in multi-domain proteins. And uh, that's how those the very name stand came into being uh, of the signal transducing NTPases with many domains. So they tended to be multi-domain proteins where that NP-loop NTPS domain tended to be central. And the C-terminus was usually characterized by a series of super secondary structure forming uh, repeats which might be beta propellers, LRRs, PPRs. And these uh, repeats tend to form these toroidal or helical structures, which can serve as a platform on which different ligands are bound. So it could serve as a sensory uh, surface. The end terminus tended to have uh, signaling domains or adapter domains. So or helix turn helix uh, domains, the HTH DNA binding domains. So this very architectural language, which we could uh, observe, this grammar, which we could deduce uh, of these architectures suggested that there was a sensing at the C terminus, which the APA TPAs or the SNAFT or any of these stand NTPAs is in the middle acted as some kind of a mediator or uh, they 
acted as a threshold set setter, which set the threshold for the signal being sensed and allowed a transmission of it to the C terminus, uh, sorry, to the N terminus, where you had uh, one of these other domains, which might be either enzymatic and thereby transduce a signal. For example, in the SWACOS group, we found uh, adenylyl cyclase or guanylyl cyclase domains and uh, serine threonine kinase domains very frequently. So there could be two kinds of signals there. It could be a soluble cyclic nucleotide, or it might be a phosphorylation event. Uh, if it was a helix turn, helix domain, a HTH, it was likely uh, activating transcription by binding a, a, a regulatory element on the DNA. So this group had a very characteristic architecture. And there was, the what I felt was the most important part of this paper, which, uh, which we developed to a greater degree in the later times, but people sort of didn't pay attention to that side, was its unification with these archaeal ATPases, which were found in large lineage-specific expansions in the different archaeal genomes, which were known to date, both CREM and uriarchial genomes, like the MJ type ATPases from what then used to be called methanococcus and uh, the pH ATPases from pyrococcus horikoshi. And they were pretty species specific or uh, the SS ATPases from sulfolobus uh, sulfotaricus, I believe. Uh, and these represented in a sense the primitive version of it. They usually had nothing more than this core ATPS domain. They didn't have those N flanking N and C terminal domains. And if they did, uh, the C terminal domain, especially in say the pH ATPases, uh, was a restriction endonuclease fold domain, REAs domain. So what it suggested was that, that especially given the species specific expansions, was that these were some kind of mobile element uh, which had a certain selfishness and they spread through the genome very much like a transposon. And uh, these signaling stand NTPases were ultimately descendants of these more transposon-like elements, uh, the MPS group, as we called it for this archaeal group. In <coughs> which were uh, prevalent in the archaea. And eventually we found versions of those in cyanobacteria, which sort of looked like the intermediate between these transposable element types, which were, or those which were prevalent in multiple copies in one particular genome versus those which were the signaling type. So the cyanobacterial there was a specific cyanobacterial clade def defined by a Nostock version, which seemed to be an intermediate. And it's links to these, it's linked to these apoptosis type versions became clear from the presence of the TIR domains, which it had at the end terminus. Mm -hmm. So the sort of the veil was slowly lifting. I can't say we fully grasped it, but what the connection which could be made was that there were these selfish elements uh, from which these apototic stand NTPases ultimately descended. So what that meant was that perhaps this apotosis role of theirs is an offshoot of their potential uh, deleterious role in the cell as mobile elements or transposons. So there was a link between something which begins as deleterious and then gets institutionalized uh, as a regular player, uh, the phenomenon which we discussed in the first part. So that connection started emerging with these stands. Uh, to cut a long story short, uh, that is moving forward, we understood the whole picture in two steps. So uh, which was stuff which we did with you. <coughs> the first thing was 
at this stage, we knew that the stands were related to the A plus ATPases uh, because they had that C terminal alpha helical extension beyond the core P loop NTPase domain. And uh, that was something which uh, was unique to A plus ATPases. So we knew that they were related, but how exactly they were related was still unclear. What we then realized was that all stands had a winged helix turn helix domain, the WHTH, C terminal to that alpha helical A like C terminal part. And this combination of an A to a winged HTH is a very unique property of one clade of A plus ATPases, which is the CDC6 ORC1 clade. And we did the chapter in a book on replication on this ORC ones, which was when we started apprehending this, uh, uh, that there was such a connection, possibility of such a connection. And down the line, we realized that it was real and made the firm link. So this suddenly cleared the way for this understanding of the transposon link. Because once we found the link to the CDC6 ORC1 like replication or uh, replication proteins, which uh, define the origins of replication in both archaea and eukaryotes, we were able to improve our searches and now unify them with the ATPS domains of transposable elements and phages, uh, such as the mu transposes of the bacteriophage mu, which is a phage which has descended from a transposon. And a whole range of transposons which have an ATPS domain coupled to their tran transposes endonuclease domain. So that's when it struck us that these restriction endonuclease like domains, which were found in these archaeal uh, stands at the C terminus, was the equivalent of those transposes like endonuclease domains, uh, which are seen in many of these transposons. And that led to this side, this a big discovery from our viewpoint, but it sort of leads away from the story of. Uh, transposons, which became effectors, causing cell death, by the way, but they are used as weaponry uh, by eukaryotic uh, pathogens like oomycetes. For example, the disease in uh, frogs, which uh, frogs being wiped out by oomycetes is uh, on account of such an effector, which is effect, which in essence is such a stand and TPAs uh, fused to the transposes where the transposes has become the effector endonuclease which uh, kills the target cell. Uh, so that whole class of what we call the CR effectors uh, were born as part of that research. But uh, the take home message was that ultimately we could trace the origin of uh, these stand NTPases to ORC CDC6 like ATPases, which were replication enzymes uh, of cellular systems. And there were mobile versions of them, which were the replication enzymes of transposable elements. That is, they were the transposases themselves. And on multiple occasions, uh, they have been domesticated, so to say either as weaponry or as uh, regulatory enzymes, which are the regular, the more uh, uh, signaling type stand NTPases. And sometimes they exist in the twilight zone where there are selfish elements which may mediate some uh, processes uh, like the killing of certain offspring uh, without the element which we see in the media systems right, uh, right. of uh, Drosophila, which came out from Drosophila genetics, where the, uh, the, uh, their systems were in mating between uh, se sex-specific mating of a certain type between individuals who have this element and who don't have this element result in elimination of offspring lacking the element. Right. 
and that is mediated by uh, the stand like NTPAs of those selfish elements. So here we could see, we could trace that entire continuum of their role in cell death from beginning as replication enzymes to becoming replication enzymes of mobile elements to mobile elements uh, playing their games as selfish elements which kill cells uh, which don't have the sort of the addiction principle which we talked of with the uh, toxin antitoxin systems and that being exapted eventually as uh, an institutionalized system for regulating uh, cell death so i think i would stop that that sort of sums up our understanding with respect to uh, these uh, uh, enzymes until a more recent foray where uh, sort of the capstone was placed to bring all these threads together right right i mean uh, you know then uh, there was this whole development you know in our group of studying conflict systems in the context of which uh, we had an even better understanding of you know apoptosis and uh, yes. And these systems, which which we will discuss in much greater detail in our next section. Yeah. So the conflict systems indeed played an important role for they brought in a further component, which was of the same principle of thresholding, which was the generation of a soluble signal to set a signal for uh, to, to set a threshold for deploying an effector. And those soluble signals may be derived from uh, parts of nucleotides, cyclic nucleotides, cyclic oligonucleotides, or NAD derivatives. So uh, those helped to raise the veil, so to say, on the TIR domain and its relatives. So uh, that was where that conflict story brought in a new uh, line of understanding, and they all came together finally uh, in the more recent works. Right, right. Well, I think we should take a break here and, uh, yeah. you know, perhaps in, in stop here. And then in the next section, we will sort of take this further to see how we actually came to our current understanding of the, or what I would say, a more complete, nothing is ever complete, but at least the uh, a much better uh, an understanding that makes biological sense now. Um, right. A more complete biological sense. So right. we'll come to that in the next section. All right. Yeah. So then I will stop this here. Okay.